Good evening, distinguished speakers, ladies, and gentlemen. I would like to welcome you to the ITPC site event at the XP World Forestry Congress Pitland Restoration in Southeast Asia, Challenges and Opportunities, Monday, 2nd May, 2022. My name is Anga Pratama Putra, and I'm greatly honored to have this opportunity. In this session, we will highlight challenges and opportunities to distill key points for peatlands restoration strategies, ways of addressing policy issues, access to financial resources, and on the ground experience on ways of peatlands restoration can enhance the well being of communities. Please welcome to our today's moderator, Dr. Haruni Krishnawati, the ITPC lead coordinator. For Dr. Harney, the floor is yours. Thank you, Anga. Uh, good evening, His Excellency, the Indonesian Ambassador to the Republic of Korea, Bapak Gandhi Sulistianto Suherman, distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome and thank you for joining the session of the site event of the 15th World Forestry Congress on peatland restoration in Southeast Asia, challenges and opportunity. I'm Haruni Krishnawati with the International Tropical Peatland Center will be chairing the session. As we all know that peatland restoration is a complex process that requires continuous monitoring to enable an adaptive iterative landscape approach that meets local condition and needs. Pitland restoration monitoring can inform a design strategy, site selection and management approach, as well as improve restoration outcomes through adjustment. As we informed by Anga, the session will discuss about the challenges and opportunity to distill the key points of the restoration strategy on tropical pitlands and why of addressing policy issues, and also sharing the ground experience on why of restoration can enhance the benefits of a community and also how the research need for, uh, needed for monitoring pitland restoration and also uh, the support that uh, contributed by international organizations such as FAO. The session will run in one hour and 30 minutes and we have a keynote uh, speaker and five panelists. First, we would like to extend a very warm welcome to our distinguished keynote speaker and panelists. The first, Your Excellency Bapak Gandhi Sulistianto Suherman, the Indonesian ambassador to the Republic of Korea. And then we will be having five panelists. The first one, Dr. Wong Sok, the head of the Environment Division, the ASEAN Secretariat. And then second, Mr. Kim hyung Kyun, the project manager of the Korea-Indonesia Forest Cooperation Center. And then Mr. Adam Jeran, the chief technical advisor of the Food and Agriculture Organizations, FAO. And we have uh, Mr. Brett Sanders, the head of Operation Rio Ecosystem Restoration. And the last but not least, uh, they will be joining with us later on, Dr. Robert Nasi, the Director General of the Center for International Forestry Research. At the moment, he is still uh, running in another session, but will be joining us later on. Without further ado, we'll be going to the first agenda. The ladies and gentlemen, please join us in welcoming remarks of His Excellency Bapak Gandhi Sulistiato Suherman, the ambassador, Indonesian Ambassador to the Republic of Korea. Mr. Ambassador, Time is yours. Honorable speakers, Dr. Robert Nasi, Director General of the Center for International Forestry Research, Mr. Adam Gerant, Chief Technical Advisor for the Food and Agriculture Organization of United Nations, Dr. Fong Sok. Head of Environment Division, ASEAN Secretariat. Mr. Kim Yong Kyun, Project Manager for, of the Korean Indonesian Forest Cooperation Center. We just met uh, in, the, in the halls. Mr. Brett Sanders, Head of Operation Restoration Ecosystem Riau 
from Rio Andalan Pulp and Paper. Madam Moderator, Dr. Haruni Krishnawati, Coordinator of International Tropical Peatland Center, the Minister, Ministry of Environmental and Forestry Republic of Indonesia, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening to all of you. Thank you for joining the event physically here at COEX Seoul Convention Center, also for those who are joining us virtually. First of all, I would like to extend my gratitude and appreciation for the hard work and dedication provided by the International Tropical Pitland Center Secretariat, the Ministry of Environment and Forestry, the Republic of Indonesia, and all partners involving in organization, organizing this session on peatland restoration in Southeast Asia challenges and opportunities. And the side event of the 50th World Forestry Congress in Seoul, Republic of Korea. It is my great honor to have this opportunity as the Indonesian ambassador to the Republic of Korea to open the session. As you know, if, as you may know, today is the first day of the Congress and it is also coincides with Idol Fitri. For Muslims around the world, I wish you a happy Idol Fitri for those who celebrate this auspicious event. May God Almighty bring you happiness, joy, prosperity, and peace on the blessed time. Allow me to read out the remark prepared, prepared by our minister, Ministry of Environmental and Forestry for, of Republic of Indonesia for this event. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. Tropical peatland are highly significant to global effort to combat climate change, as well as wider sustainable development goals. Hence, the protection and restoration of peatlands are vital in the transition toward a low carbon and circular economy. Tropical peatlands cover approximately 24 million hectares in Southeast Asia, with the majority in Indonesia, Malaysia, Brunei Darussalam, Thailand, and Vietnam, and smaller areas in Myanmar, Laos, and the Philippines. And in Indonesia, Malaysia, and Brunei Darussalam form more than 10% of the, of the land area of the country. Tropical peat swamp forests play a critical role in the economy and ecology of the region, providing timber and non-timber forest products, water supply, flood control, and many other benefits. They also play a very important role of global significance in storing an estimated 120 billion tons of carbon or approximately 5% of all global terrestrial carbon, as well as being repositionaries for unique and important biodiversity. Indonesia is a home of around 14 million hectares of peatlands, the fourth largest in the world, comprising about 36% of the world tropical peatlands. They hold a large pool of carbon storing about 30 to 40 percent of global soil carbon deposits, making them one of the world's largest carbon storage and contributing to global climate change mitigation and adaptation. Despite their importance for environmental service and economic sources, Tropical peatlands are amongst the most vulnerable ecosystem that could be 
threatening the anthrop anthroponic anthropogenic activities. Currently, peatlands are subject to rapid degradation due to strong economic and social pressure and land for agriculture and plantation. A major threat to peatlands degradation is clearing and drainage that affect ecosystem quality and health. Clearing and drainage of peatlands over recent decades has resulted in an unprecedented increase in peat fires, which not only produce deadly toxic haze and pollution, but also endanger the multitude of critical ecological service to the ecosystem could provide. Distinguished participant, ladies and gentlemen, with increasing recognition of the significance of peatland degradation, there has been a growing level of activities at the national and regional level. The Indonesian government has a strong commitment to protection and sustainable management of the peatland ecosystem. At the national level, there has been a range of action initiated, including the establishment of national mechanism for monitoring and controlling peat fires. There have also been some measures to promote the sustainable use of peatland in some sites which can be scaled up to the national or regional level. This time is a good opportunity to reflect our, our achievement of working in past year and tropical peatland and to share best practices, lessons learned and experiences in managing tropical peatland to achieve our national development agenda while contributing to the global commitment, including rising our climate ambition. Working on peatland is an, an easy task. Strong effort to restore degraded peatland have been carried out by line ministries, including the Ministry of Environment and Forestry, peatland and mangrove restoration agency, the business sectors and communities. We continuously seek an uh, effective way to prevent peatland from burning either through rewetting, revegetation, or revitalization of livelihood. Law enforcement has also needed to be implemented against the perpetrators of burning peatland, both for corporation and individuals. The government is continuously pursuing the best way to manage peatland in many aspects, including institutional, technical know-how, scientific approach, paying attention to sustainable water management, and relying on local community resources and local community wisdom. For example, enhancing paludi culture activities on deep peatland above one meter and improving rice cultivation on shallow peatlands below one meter. Through the sustainable use of peatland in accordance with peat deep, proper water management and the utilization of local resource and local wisdom, it is expected that peatlands will be managed to prevent from burning and be able to support the national development agenda. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, recognizing the significance of peatland degradation, restoration, and way of addressing policy are urgently needed. At the global level, UNFCCCC, in the meeting in Cancun in December 2010, acknowledged a new activity called rewetting and drainage, which is the reduction of GHG emission from rewetting of drainage wetland, including peatlands, could be accounted for in a nation inventory report. 
Also, under the Verified Carbon Standard Program, carbon offsetting under the peatland rewetting and conservation module of the AVOLU guidelines now become possible. Hence, in addition, the very real benefits of peatland restoration on the ground, it is now possible for them to be recognized at the international level. Indonesia has implemented strategic approach to managing its extensive peatland ecosystem found across the archipelago, which will allow the country to meet global goals to reduce greenhouse gas emission. In our first national determined contribution, NDC, the forestry sector, including peatland, is expected to be the backbone of our effort in achieving our GSG emission reduction target by 29 to 41 in 2030 compared to the business as usual scenario. Fewer than a dozen countries have so far included peatland in their nationally determined contributions. Although the carbon-rich ecosystem exists in 180 countries, Indonesia has made a strong commitment to restoring 2.4 million hectares of drained peatland. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, despite the growing awareness of the importance of peatland, there are also critical information and research gap that need to be filled to understand peatland restoration project activities. Information such as the cost and benefit of peatland restoration to water quality on the ground of experience on how restoration activities serve as a key approach for enhancing the well-being of communities and approaches for unlocking the financial resource required a restoration are all required. Recognizing the important role of tropical peatland, there have been enabling facilities program to improve education, raise awareness, strengthen institutional and local capacity and support environmentally sustainable livelihood option that utilize communities native to peatlands. To support communities that are at the front for, forefront of peatland restoration and conservation, which is crucial for the program success. It is essential to provide financial assistance. For example, budget to village authorities to, developing, to develop medium-term village development plans and budget that integrate peatland restoration activities. Helping to revitalize livelihood by promoting alternative peat-based and environmentally sustainable income generating activities to ensure communities thrive with peatland restoration take places. Over time, efforts like this across Southeast Asia will simultaneously decrease destructive peatland fires and protect our planet by leading to measurable reduction in greenhouse gas emission. All in all, I want to emphasize that peatland provides promising resource if we manage and utilize them with environmentally sound approaches. I thank you for your kind attention and wish this session will be a good place to enhance our knowledge and experience and able to strengthen our collaboration in managing and protecting our tropical peatland. Once again, thank you. Okay, now we will be uh, going to the main agenda. Uh, we will listen to some insightful uh, presentation and discussion from five prominent speakers. And I would like to remind that every speaker has 10 minutes. Uh, before we start the speaker presentation, I would like to give the, some rules that for the audience who join in person here, uh, you are encouraged if you have a question.
Sorry, what's going on? Okay, can, can I continue? Okay. Okay, for, for the audience who join us here, uh, if you have a question, uh, you can wait until the end of the session, all the presenter uh, presentation. And for the audience who joining online, uh, you get uh, you have a comment, you can write your comments through the QA box throughout the session, and we will be sure to address uh, the question later on. Without further ado, may I invite Dr. Wong Sox, the head of environment division, the ASEAN Secretariat, uh, we would like to have your view on the ASEAN peatland policy and actions. Dr. Wang Sok, the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much. Good evening, Excellency, ladies and gentlemen. This is my great pleasure to join you all today. I think this is very important that ASEAN Secretariat can have opportunity to present to all of you, not only to ASEAN member states, but this is a great opportunity for this global sort of fora. That the way we can share the important message about the pitland and the way ASEAN join hand together to address the pitland is not only for the haze, but also for many other aspects, as highlighted by the um, uh, ambassador uh, early speech. I take this opportunity, I also would like to uh, thank and also commend the Indonesian leadership and also particularly the Ministry of uh, Forestry and Environment and Forestry under the leadership and guidance of the uh, doc, uh, Minister, Dr. Siti Nubaya, that always put this on top priority for our region. So we are grateful for our leader that may try to make things very different to guide our region for better uh, future. So with that, I'm just share the overall perspective of what ASEAN doing with the peatland management, and then it's the way it can provide you confident about what we are doing. We are together to address the issue from management, coordination, and restoration. So next slide, please. Oh, I can press by myself. Okay. Um, with that, I just would like to share with you three important aspects. Uh, one's about the ASEAN agreement on transport and rehaze pollution. And then we say about specifically ASEAN peatland management strategy and the challenge opportunity that can be uh, also for uh, all of you to um, learn and also to cooperate. And uh, before that, I also I would like to thank all partner and particularly C4 and also the international uh, ITPC and uh, FAO, U, UN agency, U, U, um, UNEP, and so on that joining hand in this sort of uh, organizing this important event. So, um, as you may have heard, uh, I mean, this ASEAN Agreement on Transboundary Haze Pollution is a mother document to guide our uh, transboundary haze management in our region. We learned from the series uh, Land and Forest Fire back in 1997 and 1998. And that's the, the way we uh, formulate this um, uh, ASEAN agreement on transboundary that come into force on the 25th of May, uh, November 2003 and ratified by all members set 2015. The key objective is to prevent, monitor, and mitigate land and forest fire to control transboundary hay pollution through the concerted national effort, regional international cooperation. So now we say this about the transboundary haze. Uh, about the Hays Agreement, but what is important to Pitland? This is a mother document and, and, and a unique in the world, I said a unique in the world, bring people together to address this transboundary haze pollution. And um, we are the, the leading uh, region doing this sort of transboundary haze matter. So this provides you some of the general sort of obligation and area of cooperation, including what is the, the ambassador just highlight monitoring and assessment, and also prevention, preparedness and mitigation, emergency response and assistance, including the technical cooperation and scientific research. That's why the all key partner joining hand is quite important that the way we can promote technical cooperation and scientific research to provide a robust solution to all I mean, not only for the public, but also private sector and community. 
So with ASEAN, I mean, uh, in order to uh, implement this uh, ASEAN agreement on transboundary, hey, we have institutional framework set up to guide this sort of uh, coordination and cooperation. You see the yellow in the middle uh, column says about the conference of the party, which is equivalent to the minister level uh, that in charge for the forest and land fire. And then under that, we have committee under the under, under COP, which is the, the, the senior official level from ASEAN sort of structure. And then we have dedicated specifically ASEAN task force on peatland. So then they have uh, two wings, two wing. you have the right side and the left hand side, which is a sub regional level for the uh, one at the southern part, I mean that uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore and so on, because the and also another one we call Northern uh, sub region. Why we have this sort of regional um, sub um, uh, sub regional sort of organization because of the different sort of uh, season in between North and South of ASEAN. So in order to address the issue of forest fire on time, we should have this sort of North and South uh, sub um, um, regional uh, level to address whatever the issue happened uh, on time. So that is the institutional structure. So uh, among other, I think it's specifically to run this sort of communication coordination day-to-day -day basis. We have ASEAN Coordinating Center for Transboundary Health Pollution. And currently it's operated by ASEAN Secret as an interim, uh, interim, uh, of interim um, uh, center to provide all sort of coordination matter. And then we have also ASEAN Specialized Meteorological Center based in Singapore provide, uh, pro provide the uh, hotspot and smoke haze map, satellite imagery and so on. And we have also fire danger rating system that allow us to understand uh, the, the key issue also that can be potentially create sort of issue. And also we have um, the right support by all the national monitoring center from each ASEAN member state that provide regular report monitoring and so on. So, so far we have developed a number of guiding documents that to make it you know, available and to guide the member state and partner to work together consistently and coherent. Uh, the key document including the roadmap uh, on ASEAN cooperation toward transboundary hair pollution control with the mean of implementation. We have ASEAN uh, peatland management strategy and ASEAN program on sustainable management on peatland ecosystem. So this is the, the, also the guiding document to uh, provide this sort of guide uh, to implement, uh, control the forest fire and, and, and peatland and so on, and including the standard operating procedure that guide day-to-day uh, -day operation as well as the emergency response. So now come to uh, translate from the agreement to the, the roadmap here. They have a roadmap on the cooperation to what transform rehab pollution here. We have clear vision. It's try to do the, you know, transform rehab free ASEAN by 2020. It, and then the, with the goal at regional transform rehab pollution is eliminate through intensify collective action to prevent and control the forest and land fire. This is the, the aim that we have uh, for that uh, roadmap. So I just flash here uh, to make you aware of what is the roadmap consists of. Roadmap consists of eight strategic area. I mean, from the uh, institutional uh, setting or uh, implementation, the strategic one, and then the strategy two, which is very important about the sustainable management of peatland for peatland fire prevention. Of course, it can be contribute a multi, uh, multiple sort of uh, benefit, uh, not only uh, fire prevention. And then the other uh, strategies about uh, agriculture and land, um, agricultural land and forests, uh, also that is important uh, for um, uh, this roadmap. So uh, along the side, a number of things on the cooperation policy development and so on. So I just flushed this and now, Going to the ASEAN peatland management strategy, as you can see, ASEAN peatland management strategy itself, it built upon the roadmap that the strategy to it point out clear that we need to manage well our peatland. 
So with the peatland, we have a peatland management strategy that I don't want to highlight again. I think our region is quite rich in terms of peatland. That's why we have international ITPC uh, in established to guide and let the world contribute to that. I think the ITPC also, uh, you know, contribute a number of, um, you know, present a number of um, uh, cases to the global fora for uh, the best that we have. And also we want to show the, that is important contribute to the global uh, climate agenda as well. So Pitland have a number of value. I would not elaborate further because uh, um, Ambassador it's really highlight that contribute a lot to the water supply storage, flood control and so on, carbon sequestration. And also, um, you know, this is the majority of the Pitland in our region. And, but the issue is still a challenge uh, due to that um, um, uh, uh, practice and also the uh, fire and also the climate sort of condition. So here to present you ASEAN, what ASEAN doing with regard to the uh, uh, peatland. So we have uh, ASEAN peatland management initiative that adopted in 2003 by the high technical task force to guide the early stage of the peatland management and cooperation. And then later on, we have developed the ASEAN uh, peatland management strategy, APMS 2006 and 2020. That, that strategy provides uh, specifically uh, about the, how peatland can be managed and, and, and restored, uh, and also including the research and cooperation. And then we have also ASEAN uh, Peatland Forest Project, uh, uh, APFP 2009-2014, Sustainable Mid Management of uh, Peatland Forest in Southeast Asia, CPIT, and the ASEAN Program on Sustainable Peatland Ecosystem, APIS and PE. That is from our past project. Now, this is the way I want to show you about this uh, ASEAN program on sustainable management peatland ecosystem that consists of a number of key activity. So it's not only restoration, but it's from the identify of the key uh, peatland and a priority. So here the peatland task for meeting uh, to guide uh, the, the implementation and management and cooperation of peatland. Uh, just for your reference, um, among other, I think we have an uh, important cooperation with partner. This is one of the uh, one of the big program on the sustainable use of peatland and haze mitigation in ASEAN. The called Salt and Super, with the overall objective promote sustainable management of peatland in ASEAN through collective action in hand cooperation, support sustainable local livelihood, reduce risk of fire and associate has and contribute to the global environmental management. So I just flash here for your information. I mean, I have two component, component one on the peatland governance, component two on the non-state actor participation. So the governance uh, part is implemented by GIZ while the non-state actor implemented by the um, WRI and uh, people for PIT. So, one of the most important program as well that we are um, uh, implement project right now is measurable action for haze free ASEAN peatland management in Southeast Asia. That consists of three main objectives to be a capacity to enhance the availability and usage of knowledge product that run by C4. And also the uh, third objective in hand ASEAN regional coordination mechanism that run by ASEAN Secretariat. So these all that key activity, and I would not go into all detail and welcome any question later on. And then the project management peatland ecosystem in the Mekong country run by IUCN that try to strengthen their capacity and also identify the peatland and the key priority in their area and how they can accelerate further where they integrate in their uh, wetland management plan or any other plan that to make it more um, coherent to address this peatland issue. Now, the APMS has really come to end. This is the, 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 the final review of the implementation of the APMS. So um, the review finding, it present that the four objective uh, in hand awareness and capacity on peatland 
and also the address transboundary hay pollution, general objective, promote sustainable peatland. So this is the result. I may not say more, but I mean, I will go to the key point because we run out of time, time is critical. This is just to give you information about peatland. Uh, it's quite dominant in Indonesia and some part of Malaysia and so on. Now, the challenge and opportunity. So uh, challenge, as you may know, the climate change, one of the thing, and also the practice, including agriculture and multi-purpose of different sort of user that can be a, a challenge. Also the limited in terms of data uh, information and so on that as highlighted by the ambassador. And, and still there's some low, practice, uh, low understanding and, and, and poor practice somehow in relation to the pit lane management. So uh, the opportunity is there in terms of we have right now in three uh, important um, opportunity that for us to, to make a difference with that I also invite any one of us if you have any sort of input or, or want to participate. We have three important uh, development of new ASEAN High Free Roadmap 2022-2030 and a new APMS 2022-2030. And also the investment framework that to guide the success of implementation and cooperation with ASEAN partner as well as opportunity for cooperation with ASEAN dialogue and development partner. So that is the specific opportunity. So this is the overall conclusion, but I mean, I just want to say one word uh, or two words important for you to consider. I think from the finding it's quite important to uh, note that the climate change, one of the window that could be challenged to the pitland, but also right now it could be the opportunity. There is the finding confirmed that we have limited information and data from the pitland, how the pitland contribute to climate change and how climate change impact to the, to the pitland. So this really is still a big gap. So with that, I think uh, the research and partner may wish to look at that is about the, you know, how peatland and climate change interact and, and, and can be uh, take this as opportunity for uh, tap into resources for uh, further uh, support in the peatland and, and ecosystem and community. And with that, I, I also would like to highlight the second point on the peatland. It's uh, about ASEAN, it's the way we work, it work collaboratively. With that regard, ASEAN standard D to support and uh, facilitate any uh, partner would like to talk more and coordinate with ASEAN Secretary. Please feel free to reach out to ASEAN Secretary. We are well, welcome any sort of initiative. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Wong, uh, for your presentation sharing with us about the uh, ASEAN Secretariat uh, programs and has been implemented uh, the policy and program on sustainable management for peatlands and also for uh, fire prevention. Uh, ASEAN Secretariat has uh, have many, a lot of uh, management strategy like on peatland and then also program on sustainable management of peatland ecosystem re rehabilitations and and also highlighting some uh, challenges and of course the opportunity. Thanks again for uh, Dr. Wong's. Uh, next, I would like to invite the next speaker, uh, Mr. Kim Kyung Kyun from the project manager for the Korea Indonesia Forest Cooperation Center. He would like to share with us about the partnership between Indonesia and Korea, especially on peatland restoration. Mr. Kim, the floor is yours. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Kim Hyung Kyun, the project manager, uh, Korea Indonesia Forest Cooperation Center. And today, I would like to share our experience during we are implementing the peatland restoration project in Jambi, Indonesia. I think some of you, you have never heard about that uh, Jambi, Indonesia. So first of all, let me show that the location of the Jambi and our project site. Uh, west side of the Indonesia, you can find the Sumatra Island, one of the biggest island in Indonesia. 
And then Jambi is one of the province in Sumatra. And the Kota Jambi, it means Jambi city is the capital city of the Jambi province. We have the project office here. And then in the Jambi uh, city, there is the airport also. And then we have around four flights per day from Jambi, uh, from uh, Jakarta to the uh, Jambi city. And north of the city, you can see the Patanghari River. And this plays, very, uh, this plays a very important role in our project for logistic and rewriting activities. And also the communities, uh, the, uh, the, the life of the community of our partners. From the Jambi city, around the 50 kilometers to northeast, we can see reach it, to, we can reach it to our project site, to, which is a Londran Pitlin, Pit, uh, Pit, uh, Londran Pitlin protected area. We can call it a Heilge Londran. And then you can see the yellow color box. This is the Heilge Londran. And in 2015, and we had the forest fire here. And also in 2019, we had another very big forest fire here again. You can see this using the satellite pictures and then we lost around 12,000 hectare forest there. If you, this pic if you see this picture closely, you can see the village by the Patanghari River then we can find this as a very typical uh, village in the Indonesian Pitland area. Now let's see the history of our project. We made MOU between Korea and Indonesia uh, to central government in 2016. And we have spent another five years to implement our project. We couldn't start our project from uh, we could start our project from end of the 2021. Yes, we have met many stakeholders. Even our goal is same to restore the pit land. The details were quite different because each one has uh, their own condition and ideas and viewpoint. And our management team realized that the goal of the project is not only to restore the pit, uh, restore the pit land. But also the goal of this project is working together to restore our pit land. Maybe all the management team in ODA project, they have a strong intention to drive the project in their way efficiently. But actually, yes, we, we need to go together as a joint and cooperation project uh, partner. After that, we, uh, the way of the approach to the project was uh, totally changed. Efficiency for a project is important, but effectiveness is also critically important. You need to consider both of them very seriously with all of our stakeholders to implement the project smoothly. Then our project could speed up. As you might know, most of the pitland restoration project has a three R activities. Our project main activities are also same, having three R: rewetting, revegetation, and revitalization. In rewetting section, yes, we have many partners also here, and then one of the most important partner is Jambi University. And then they are specialized to local pitland survey. Also, we communicate with the communities in our project area very closely to get full support to build the canal blocks. For revitalization activities, we have 20 facilitators. We are doing these activities in 10 villages with the 20 facilitators. It means uh, two facilitators in each village. And then they stay 24 hours a day with the community people to check real issue 
in each village. Also help the community to develop their business plan. The business plan is aimed to create alternative source of livelihood also as a community empowerment. In this activities, we make a collaboration between Korea Indonesia Forest Cooperation Center and community village and also local government to create alignment with the government program, which can make village uh, business plan run uh, sustainable later. And there are 10 villages around the Haiga Londran, and our facilitators are working with, together at the field with the community people for revitalization program. For revegetation, we did many activities such as a building bridge, access road, working lodge, and nursery, and then planting path and other facilities. We share these works with the community and the stakeholders so that they can participate also to build the community ownership in this project together. And also we try to find all the labor in the local community nearby our project site. And then these are the villages nearby our project site. Every day we are working with 35 to 70 people from those villages together. And the two by seedlings, we have a contract with the nurseries based on the communities around the Haiga Laundrum. So we still can cooperate with uh, our partners very closely, even uh, buying the seedlings. Based on our experience, most important part in project is cooperation with our partner. If we want to do it all by ourselves, it was not easy. It's not easy. Then nothing gonna be happen. There are a lot of specialists at the field that we need their advice and cooperation to see the real condition at the field. And they are our partners to implement the successful project. We should go together with mutual respect. We believe only through the cooperation, this project can be implemented and be useful to the local community in Jambi. We would like to take this opportunity to express our special thanks to our partner, uh, Directorate of the Pitland Degradation uh, Control in MOEF and the Forestry Service of Jambi Province Tanjung Jabung Timur FMU and Moro Jambi FMU and Balipang, Eraka, Palembang and Jambi University. And thanks all of you too. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kim, for sharing with us uh, regarding the project cooperation between Korea and Indonesia on restoring peatland located in uh, Jambi province. I think we should move to the next speaker, uh, moving from bilateral uh, cooperation. And now we have um, Adam Jiran from FAO. He is the chief technical advisor from the FAO. Uh, we would like to have your thoughts on how uh, FAO will support the countries, especially in uh, peatland restoration and monitoring. Mr. Adam, time is yours. Yes, and I hope what we're uh, participating in is going to be very useful for and interesting for all of us. But let's not waste time. Um, the main thing I want to say is in the first five words. Climate action needs peatland action. I want to talk about what FAO is doing, but all we do is support countries. It's the countries that do this work. 
So what I'll be talking about, I'm the Chief Technical Advisor on some forest and peatland monitoring project work in, based in Jakarta in Indonesia. And I'm supported by a, a peatland technical lead in our FAO office, and of course, many people in our countries. I'm gonna do a very quick run through. So apologies if I go fast, but you will get the slides afterwards. I want to talk about the status and trends of Indonesia's peatlands and really give you a sense of why peatlands matter for climate change. I'll talk about FAO's work on peatlands, but as I said, it's really the country's work that are doing this in the end. We support countries through technical solutions and capacity development. In Indonesia, I'll give some examples, but we also share that knowledge globally through the Global Peatlands Initiative and work we do bilaterally in other countries. I want to end with some challenges and opportunities because I think that was asked for by our presenters and I hope there's some good opportunities there. Let me set the scene by saying that globally, peatlands are the world's largest terrestrial carbon store. Only 3% of the land area, 3% according to FAO, 10% by ASEAN. It's small, but it contains twice as much carbon as the forests. And this has only recently been recognized. And so peatland only in the last decade or so has come to the prominence as an activity. Deforestation was always, or has been long recognized. Indonesia is really important. It's a superpower in peatlands. It's the country with the world's largest area of tropical peatlands. Not peatlands overall, but tropical peatlands. And it's the tropical peatlands that actually are some of the deepest and have some of the largest stores of, of um, carbon. In Indonesia, the estimates vary between 15 and 22 million hectares, depending on your definition and the depth. The really important point that we need to know is that most of Indonesia's peatlands more than half are degraded in a degraded state because of drainage past activities like logging and conversion to large industrial plantations, oil palm, pulpwood, forestry plantations, also agriculture and fire, especially since the 1990s. Um, this has been a really significant issue and the drained and degraded peatlands are extremely prone to more fire. It's a vicious circle. They then get land subsidence, which leads to flooding. So in climate change terms, they release significant greenhouse gas emissions from peat decomposition that you don't really see because it's the surface of the peat degrading as the carbon gets eaten by bacteria and fungi and, and disappears. And particularly when you get a fire, it can go down a lot more. So you're losing valuable carbon stores from the top. When that happens, you get a reduced ability to provide ecosystem services. All those really important values of carbon storage, biodiversity, and a productive ecosystem that supports local livelihoods is damaged, and in many cases, extremely hard to repair. The degraded peatlands are vulnerable to climate change even more when they become degraded. If they are in good condition, they are more resilient. Once you get severe fires, you get large environmental and socioeconomic damage, particularly in the 2015 fires, they burnt 2.6 million hectares, 40% of that was peatlands. It produced a toxic smoke that covered parts of Indonesia and neighboring countries. The estimate is more than 100,000 premature deaths and more than $16 billion in economic losses in one fire season alone. And it's the local communities who live in these peatlands or surrounding areas and depend on them that suffer the most. In, this is a, affect an estimated 15 million people with about one in 10 of those living below the poverty line. They are critical. Let's step back from the sort of local picture there and show you this old graph. It goes from 1960 through to 2010, uh, 2015, 16, doesn't show the next big spike, but it shows that the real increase in climate change greenhouse gases is coming in other development areas like fossil fuels and cement. The deforestation has stayed relatively stable for the last, uh, since the 1960s through to the 1990s. 
Then there has been a decline since the 1990s. That's actually a success story, the reduction in deforestation. But I want to point out this. Spike in 96, 97. It shows how important they are. This is the one I use this old graph because it's got that important fact. When you put this in context, the Indonesian fires in 2015 released 11 million tons of carbon per day. It's larger than the daily fossil fuel use of the whole of 28 countries of Europe every day. All that industry, all those people. It's huge. When the peatlands burn, it's an enormous impact. I hope I've given you the kind of context that we're dealing with. I pass my thanks to Daniel Murdiasso for borrowing these slides, which are the C4 key messages about peatlands and fire. Fire occurrence is particularly associated with drought, and those cycles are getting worse and more pronounced. It's a periodic cycle, according in some countries, the El Nino cycle is particularly prevalent. Rewetting is possible, and it does help uh, by backfilling or blocking the canals. There are effective ways to reduce the fire risk. They can really help raise the water levels and reduce that fire risk. So something can be done about these problems. The information on the depth of the peat and the hydrology, especially that groundwater level, the water depth from below the surface is critical bit of information. And it's a key for working out the fire prevention and the emission reduction strategies. Unfortunately, climate change is going to make these things worse. This is going to become a vicious cycle and likely to get worse in the future. However, there are some things that can be done. I will skip through this quickly because we've already heard about the three strategies Indonesia is using, rewetting, revegetation, revitalization, the three R's. This has been a, a new policy, relatively new since 2015. Let me show you something about the data and some of the things that FAO is doing. Here is a map in the top, which shows some of the peatlands and some of those red dots are the field monitoring points for groundwater level. It's a huge challenge to restore this. We need to work out where and what's going on. Up to 90% of the area is degraded in, in some way, and we have a lot of a lack of good data. So when we recognized that, we identified that we could do uh, some support for getting estimates of peat soil moisture using satellite radar data. This water level is critical because it's related, as I've said, to the greenhouse gas and fires. So we used some radar satellite data to go from a monitoring situation with these 24 dots through to produce a map over millions of hectares every two weeks with the new satellite data almost for free. You have people to process the data, but you don't, it's cheaper than going to the field. So we've developed this and trained 100 people from 14 organizations to process this data and interpret it. So now we've got new soil moisture maps over millions of hectares that can give us an up-to-date estimate that is more comprehensive than those points around the edge. Let me just show you really quickly. This is a, um, a peatland hydrological unit in South Kalimantan. I'm gonna run you through the chart to tell you what's happening here. The blue line is the model data from satellites. Orange line is the field groundwater level. This is a big area. It's almost half a million hectares. So it's about 100 kilometers, 150 kilometers wide and top to bottom. If you watch this chart, this is going from 2018. Get a really big drop in 2020 where there's a decline and it goes through. There's a really powerful piece of satellite data. It's very closely tracking the year today, but it's very closely tracking the field modeled. Uh, field measured data. You'll also see if you watch closely, that red dot in the green dot definitely goes to the north of the coast. You start to say where the which part of the countries are dry, where is there likely to be fires? Possibly this data could be used for that. We haven't yet, there's a lot of opportunity for it. So we've developed the technique, we have an index, we want to explore it more. We've documented a lot of this. In our, in our materials, we have a website there that you can look at later. We've got a manual for running it in Indonesian and in English, in 
it's free, open source, anybody can run it. And we've run workshops, as I've said, across Indonesia. So we've got some tools, we've got some problems, we've got some tools, but so we also still have these challenges. I want to talk about a few things that challenges need, that we need to work on. Institutional challenges, agency coordination, and I'm talking here multiple levels of government, but I'm also talking internationally between countries. I think this is really important as we heard from the ASEAN um, colleague. We've got a new research agency in Indonesia bringing together a lot of resources. That could be an interesting opportunity. It could be a challenge to get it functioning properly as well. We've got a small number of highly trained, sort of well-trained, competent staff in many countries, but it's not enough for the size of the problem. And they have high staff turnover and some challenges internally, institutionally. I think there's a big gap and a need for socioeconomic work, understanding what is going on in the field, why people are burning and setting fire to those areas for their livelihoods. We need to design some better incentives to help them not do that. Some companies have been doing that and getting good results. We need to expand on that. And we need to do more research and better select those research sites. I'm gonna really skip through this quickly because I've gone over time. I think I've explained to you about the fire and degradation we need to understand the causes of that better and the conditions and thresholds for a surface fire to become a peat fire underneath the ground. There are fire danger rating systems. We better met, we need to com combine those, coordinate them, and work out how they better relate to the field act activities in the field. Subsidence is a big gap, not, not measured or worked on as much as it could be, but with new tools like the satellite data, radar data can give you some estimates. Agriculture, restoration opportunities are all there. Sharing data is a final thing. And I'll leave you with the slides with the links where all of our data and our publications are available for you to work on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adam, uh, for sharing with us regarding the FAO works in supporting countries and pitland actions. and. And also, uh, in particular, you also mentioning how uh, FAO have in supporting Indonesia, and in, uh, especially in technical solution and also in uh, global partnership on peatland uh, restoration and monitoring. Distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen, I think we should move to the next speaker. We would like to invite Mr. Brett Sanders, head of Operation Ecosystem Rio uh, Restoration. Time is yours. Continue to be. So tonight, I want to share with you, if I may, um, the experience from one company um, on one project for what we're doing to protect and restore peatlands in Riau Province, Sumatra. I'm with the April Group, our, or our national name is uh, Riau Andalan Pulp and Paper. I'm the head of operations for this uh, re restoration program called. Uh, Riau Ecosystem Restoration, or RER. Uh, April is a large uh, developer of fiber plantations and a manufacturer of pulp, paper, and viscose, um, in case you're, you're not aware. We, we sell our products in over 70 different countries around the world. 75% of our volume, however, is sold in the Asia Pacific region. Let's see. There we go. So the RER program is 100% uh, financed and, and uh, led by April Group. Um, we, of course, working very closely with many collaborators, uh, the, the local government and the national government, um, especially the, the uh, Riau Conservation Agency, um, as well as uh, many forestry experts and NGOs and, and the communities as well. Um, we have a commitment for five concessions over a 60 year period. We've been issued a license or licenses by the ministry uh, for a 60 year period starting in 2013. Um, the total area of the RER is 150,000 hectares of degraded peat forest um, on two landscapes, the Kampar Peninsula and Padang Island. And the company's commitment for funding began um, in earnest in 2015, shortly after we started the program. 
we committed $100 million for the first 10 years of the program. And this will be increasing uh, starting this year, actually. Um, we're, we're, we've made some new commitments, which will increase this funding. This funding is not only for the RER program, but it's also for um, other conservation efforts that are being run by the program, by the April group. Um, and our main partners, we have three, are BIDARA, a local NGO focusing on uh, community empowerment, uh, Fauna and Flora International, both at the UK level and here in Indonesia, as well as the uh, Wildlife Conservation Society, both from the US and here in Indonesia. So where is the RER specifically located? We're about 150 kilometers uh, from Singapore. We're on the east coast of Sumatra in the province of Riau. Um, we are in two landscapes again, Kampar is to the south, which is a 700,000 hectare uh, uh, peninsula and Padang Island to the north. We have 20,000 hectares in the north and 130,000 hectares in the south. Um, the, the dark green you see is the largest block of peat forest remaining in Sumatra. It's about 344,000 hectares of peat forest. This is larger than some national parks, and especially the peat parks that are in Sumatra. Um, Sumatra, excuse me, Riau province itself, 50% of the province, nearly 50% is peatland. That's um, about 4 million hectares. And what's remaining in peatland based on some of the latest studies I've read is only about one and a half million hectares of peat forest remaining in Riau province. Um, and, and we've got a significantly the largest block um, under our management. The, um, as you can see in the lighter green, there's a ring of plantations. These are a, a ring of fiber plantations managed by April and, and one or two other companies, which provide a buffering ring uh, or, or zone to protect the RER at the center of, this, of these landscapes. At the center are peat domes, which, may, which range from three to 15 meter deep peat. Yeah? Um, this ring of plantations not only provides a reduction of threats, but also financial stability. Um, the fiber that's produced, of course, from these plantations on the ring goes to the mill, produces our three main products, which produces revenue and profits, which are then reinvested back into the conservation program. And by being associated with April, the RER program, uh, program benefits from long-term operational and technical capabilities of the company. Um, I have 170 employees who are working within those black lines on the two blocks um, that are managing and protecting and planting trees. And, but we also get to draw on the, the, uh, the assets of the larger company from the human resources, legal, technical, remote sensing, and other, other uh, support services. The RER takes a four-prong approach, strategic approach to its uh, restoration work. The first and most important is protection because peat swamp forests do recover quickly in the absence of new disturbance. If you can protect them from new disturbance, they begin to return. And that's our experience anyway. So protection is number one. Um, in parallel with this, we do num numerous assessments. We monitor, monitor, monitor. We're monitoring the wildlife, the, all the biodiversity, uh, socio-cultural economic assessments in the communities that surround us, as well as carbon stocks. Um, and then from these uh, assessments, we're able to um, identify gaps and needs, which, which, which focus our restoration work. And then the management. The management is the tough part. We're, de we're dealing with people. We're dealing with our collaborators, the government, the communities, and our own teams. Coordinating and managing people is the tough one. And Mr. Kim is shaking his head. <laughs> I think in agreement. <laughs> but it does come with challenges. Yeah, we do have challenges like all of us would know. Um, one of our main challenges is the highly degraded areas um, in, our, in our concessions, which, which need active regeneration. These are very isolated, difficult to access, and it takes considerable effort to, to get our teams into those locations. Another challenge we have on the ground is uh, unfortunately songbird poaching. This is a historical cultural norm in Indonesia to collect birds. This particular trade is driven by competitions in some of the city centers here in Indonesia and elsewhere. 
and that, that uh, provides uh, incentive in a sense for people to go out and collect birds. Um, and of course, illegal logging. Legal logging, um, it, it continues to be an issue um, in, in some places where forest remains. And, and a lot of this is driven because local sources of wood around communities are gone. Yeah, they've been converted to other plantation or cash crops. So how do we deal with these challenges? Well, number one for us is protection, but through our active security patrols and community agreements. Example of one of these is our fishing agreement with the fishermen that, 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 that live temporarily, uh, periodically in our forest and using the rivers. They've agreed not to burn left and right of the river. They've agreed not to uh, use poisons or chemicals or electric shock to catch fish. And as a result, this has increased water, improved water quality and increased their fish catch. So this is a positive. And our active patrols ensure this continues and having establishing trust and relationships with the, with the people. Um, in terms of our restoration work, we've now um, completed 140 hectares out of the 875 that we consider highly degraded and needing active regeneration or planting. But this comes at huge effort. Um, it's not just putting a tree in the ground, you must return uh, at least two or three times a year for four or five years to maintain that single tree and all the trees that have been planted. Um, so this is not just a one-time effort, it's, it's, it's ongoing. And of course, um, the most important thing is the rewetting. Um, we've identified 146 kilometers of old drainage canals left behind by the previous companies which operated in these landscapes. And our teams are busy constructing hand-built dams using sandbags and other materials we have no roads, we have no access other than rivers and, and, and walking through the, through the peat. And so, but we've impacted about 9,000 hectares of, of, of peat by re-wetting these, these open old drainage canals. And then biodiversity. Um, this is probably the most unique and most interesting part of our jobs is monitor, monitor, monitor um, again. And uh, we've now identified over 838 different species of fauna and flora within our boundaries and on the peninsula. Um, 66 of these are uh, identified by the IUCN red list as globally threatened and another 100 or so are protected by the uh, uh, Indonesian government or listed on the CITES list. I'd be happy to talk more about biodiversity. And one of the benefits of all of our monitoring is the government uh, looked for us to help um, assist them in returning a Sumatran tiger back to the forest. Um, the Kampar Peninsula in particular is designated as a tiger conservation landscape. Um, it is one of six priority landscapes in Indonesia for uh, the, uh, the National Tiger Restoration or Recovery Program. And recently we did a survey uh, with Sintas, a, a local NGO, which says that if you go to the forest, 73% chance you're gonna see a tiger sign in that area, which is good or scary, one of the two. <laughs> But we did release Karina back in, uh, her, was her name, back in December 2020. We put a GPS collar on her, and uh, this was the first time a tiger has been collared in, in the peatlands, and we were able to see where she moves, how she moves, um, and how she establishes her home range. We were able, even able to identify what she eats based on the, the, the intensive monitoring and field teams going out behind her to see what she was eating. Um, a few days behind her, no good. No, uh, um, but one of the most interesting things um, was the, uh, uh, the fact that she spent majority of her time in the production areas, in the plantations. This was a very interesting finding for us. We monitored her for five months until the battery died. For long-term and science-based monitoring um, and, and information collection, we are doing greenhouse gas flux monitoring. We have uh, RER is home to one of four greenhouse gas towers that the April group has established. These towers have been operating for about five years now. Um, and the other three towers, other than the RER, one is in a, is a fiber plantation in peat. Another one is in a fiber plantation in mineral soil. And the last is in mixed, uh, mixed land use, um, also on peat. So with this, we're now able to um, clarify and identify what the carbon emissions, uh, sequestration, and, and, and all of that is, is doing in these three different, four, four different cover types. It'll help to clear up the, the uncertainty about some of these because we're monitoring this 24, there's 
10 readings per second occurring 24-7, 365 a year. The data from these towers is going to be extremely beneficial to recalculating emission factors for carbon credits in the future. I'm almost finished. <laughs> the last but not least, of course, are the communities. There's about 40,000 people living around our area, none of which live inside of our concessions, which is clearly a, uh, a benefit and, and, uh, and reduces our threats. But they, we do have fishermen. There's, there's several families which do utilize the forest inside our area for fishing. Um, and they are all dependent on the clean water and the wildlife and, and the, the resources that, that originate from our, our areas. And finally, um, to share for the future, um, we have recently completed our eco research camp. This is a camp that serves as our base of operations for the RER staff, but it's also open and available to students, researchers, and other stakeholders who have a sincere interest to study and learn and understand more about peatlands in Indonesia and what, what our program is doing. Um, so the, the research uh, uh, camp is a, is a very good asset for us to have um, to, to, to share our experiences. And so finally, I'd just like to uh, close out by saying thank you very much. Um, you can see all of our social media outlets there on the right. And if you are, are inclined, we've uh, recently been featured in a uh, documentary film called Frontier Sumatra which was released uh, late last year um, on the Discovery Asia channel. And it will appear, it'll be appearing again on that and, and on some other channels in, across Europe and, and Greece, I understand, is next to, to have it as well. So check out our social media and Frontier Sumatra. And thank you very much. Thank you, Brett, for sharing with us uh, on your grown experience on protecting and also restoring the tropical peatland landscape, especially in the uh, peninsular uh, islands and uh, Rio. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think uh, we already run out of time and we still have uh, our last but not least, our great speaker, Dr. Robert Nasi, the Director General of the Center for International Forestry Research will be sharing with us about the research and also the future for the peatland restoration and monitoring. Time is yours. Here I am, uh, folks, uh, <clears throat> standing here be between uh, you and uh, Well Deserved Rest, and uh, I only have 125 slides. So, <clears throat> but thanks to all the good presentation before, I managed to reduce that to five or six, so it should be manageable. So, <laughs> looking at the, the, the main issue that we have seen is that um, how, how do we monitor and how do we manage uh, tropical peatland restoration? And, and Adam uh, showed some things, uh, a colleague from uh, uh, IPP told us anything. So how do we create, uh, in a sense, a framework on monitoring uh, restoration? How do we define success? Um, is success when something is put under restoration or is success when it has been restored for 20 years, or it's success when it has been restored for 40 years. Uh, I will pass this one. The degradation of peatland, you know how it happened. You have the, and then you have subsidence, greenhouse gases, and problems happen. So we do need to restore degraded peatland. We need to know how much it costs, and what is success looking like, and how do we monitor restoration effort. And, and, and that's fundamentally true for any restoration activity, be it in peatland or not. And, and we had the curiosity to look at, okay, what, what are the restoration efforts in Indonesia? And, and in, a, in a paper that is currently in press, uh, we did a survey and recorded something like 341 uh, restoration projects in Indonesia, the one that we could record. And you can see the, the project duration in egg. It's mainly very short term. And you have a couple of projects that are more than, than 10 years. Out of these 341 restoration projects, 217 say that they were successful. And when we uh, ask people, okay, what do you mean by success? What are the reasons why you are successful? Quite interesting, interestingly, and I, I will show that in the next slide, it's awareness and community engagement, the main reason for success. It's, well, there is a bit of technology, land tenure, sustainability, funding, but no. The main reason you are successful in restoring peatland is that you work with the local people, 
you convince them and they are buying in it, and then you can estimate the future success. Okay, so, so th these are the, the, the main elements that were recorded as success in, in 2017. So that gives you an idea of the basis of, of what could be a, a monitoring of, of, of peatland restoration. So what do we need to monitor? And then we have a very good paper that was prepared uh, for FAO for that. And what you need to monitor in, a, in a restoration monitoring is different to what you need to monitor in an intact peatland which is different to what you need to monitor in a degraded peatland. So, <clears throat> and the question is that, how do you operationalize this monitoring? And we had no peculiar knowledge about that. So we organized a series of workshop with uh, uh, various stakeholders uh, going from uh, government to uh, 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 community to uh, peatland restoration agency, uh, private company, uh, with uh, four webinars and, and collecting ideas. And okay, what, what do you need to monitor? How do you monitor? How do you operationalize it? <clears throat> and creating a framework of, of criteria and indicator in terms of, okay, you have, you have this set of criteria and indicator that you will implement, that will implement uh, on the ground to monitor uh, restoration. And then based on the result, you can see the trajectory and you can decide whether you consider that it is a success or not. And this uh, criterion indicator, um, you can see here that in the table, I mean, there are uh, about biophysical aspect, economical aspects, governance, uh, and pretty classic. Uh, these are the things that come from the ground. And what is missing now and what we would like to do is really putting it into action. How do we transform something that is a theoretical framework of criteria and indicator in something that, that could be a, a certification system like FSC or PEFC have done, but for this specific ecosystem that is peatland. And that's it. And that's my uh, small effort in terms of restoring peatland. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert, for your kind presentation. Also, keeping the time uh, short, so we will <laughs> uh, finish uh, all the presentation uh, before 8 p.m. Actually, and uh, we have an audience here. And also, uh, if you have any question, one or two, we still allow to use this room. Because we are lucky, we have uh, this is actually the last session of today in this room, so uh, we can have uh, a little bit more time, but uh, up to uh, five to uh, ten minutes actually. But uh, we would like to open the discussion. Uh, we'll come to a participant who would like to ask uh, the question. Would like to open one or two question. If anyone would like to ask a question to the presenters. Um, any question from online participants? Not yet. Okay. Uh, okay, Michael Brady. Uh, please, uh, you can introduce your, yourself, <laughs> everyone. You come forward and uh, to whom the question would you like to address, please. Hi, uh, Michael from C4 ICRAF. Um, a question on peatland restoration, and I'm just wondering if anybody, I mean, I've, I've seen a lot of um, efforts and, and data on rewetting, uh, some degree on revegetation, but I'm really curious to know whether anybody is tracking actual peat um, accumulation. 
you know, is, 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 is Pete continuing to degrade? Has it been, you know, can you get it at a steady state? Or are there cases where you can actually see um, accumulation of peat? And you know, to what degree is that part of, of the restoration uh, recipe? So any, anybody, any comments? Appreciate it, thanks. Okay, thank you, Michael, for your good question and comment, actually. Uh, we'd like to invite uh, speakers. Uh, we'd like to respond. Any one of you? Brett? Okay, please. Good question, Michael. <laughs> peat subsidence or growth is not easy to monitor. Um, number one, it takes significant time. You can't just do it in one or two years. It has to be looked at over the long term. Even the physical monitoring is difficult because when you walk up to that point, you gotta make sure you don't step on the point <laughs> or else you've subsided it immediately. Um, it depends on rainfall too. Um, when more rainfall, Maybe you're going to get some bulging in the peat surface. And if you, if you measure it in the dry season after six months of low rainfall, it's definitely going to be down a little bit. So from our monitoring, and we're doing regular monitoring on our transects um, across the Kampar and, and uh, also a little bit on Palau Padang, which you might be familiar with. <laughs> You've traipsed through there a while ago. Um, the, uh, you know, we, we see highly variable um, annual numbers coming eat from each of our we, we monitor about once every three months uh, for a particular point yeah and it, it's up and down throughout the year um and i the long-term trend meaning four years five years worth of data it it's it's still declining over the overall yeah um and uh yeah, what are the reasons? Well, it, it might be because my guys are stepping on it sometimes, <laughs> too close to it or walking around it. It could be because, you know, rainfall is uh, a little, little less than maybe 100 years ago. I, I don't know exactly. Uh, it could be because temperatures are higher than they were 50 years ago. Um, but yeah, what we're finding in our monitoring is it's, it's definitely not getting thicker. It's, it's just going down, yeah. So, improvements in how we monitor, more suggestions and setting up the points um, are also needed from the science guys. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Brett, uh, for your uh, response. Uh, Adam, you would like to add some well, comments? Well, just, just a little bit of more anecdotal information rather than drawing on hard research that I can point to, but... Um, I have heard a number of researchers say that they've they've been able to uh, uh, get a, a, a feeling, an estimate uh, of the the fact that the the peak groundwater level uh, is um, a very good a sort of indicator, a surrogate of the rate of decomposition. So if you have more peat exposed, that is more peat able, it, it goes down faster. So there is, and the converse, we think, or they think, should apply. But this has been very hard to prove in practice, that if you re-wet the peat, it should slow down the decomposition. Whether you can actually turn it around and get it to accumulate again, I think the general feeling is at that point, you need to do something more. You need to put the vegetation that was giving the accumulation back on site. And I'm not talking shrubs and bushes and things that burn frequently because then you'll continue to be in a spiral downwards. You need to get large vegetation that has big biomass that produces a lot of leaf litter and then starts to build up in excess of the rate of decomposition. So you can slow things down with the peatland re-wetting, getting the, the, the water up to the surface again. And that's the first and most important step. But that's only part of the effort. Then you've got to put some big vegetation in there and wait a long time and protect it and not have it burn. So it's a really challenging combination of factors, but in terms of the science and the biophysical thinking about it, most people say it is possible, but extremely difficult because of the factors of fire and other disturbances that come in. So it's possible, but really hard, but it's really important and it's got a huge potential. And if you don't, it's just going to keep emitting and going to keep degrading. So you're in a downward spiral anyway. 
So you, you, we should be trying to do something about it because it's a big opportunity. The land is in many cases not being actively used for other things. So it's, it's a big, hard thing, but a big one that we should be grasping. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Adams, for your uh, comments. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think uh, we have reached the end of the sessions on peatland restoration in Southeast Asia, challenges and opportunity. Thanks for all uh, speakers and audience in this room and also joining us online. And also for uh, the participant, uh, Michael, who actually uh, asked the questions. Uh, I will not highlight or summarize uh, our discussion today, but uh, two things, uh, two points that I would like to say. Uh, the first one is about tropical uh, peatlands in Southeast Asia play a critical role in uh, economy and ecology of the regions. And despite the informal and economic importance, they are also vulnerable ecosystem that could be threatened by anthropogenic activities. So strong efforts are urgently needed to protect, to restore and sustainably manage our peatlands. I hope our discussion and our uh, presentation uh, in this session today could have benefit for all of us and especially for future of our uh, tropical peatlands. I would like to say again, thanks to all speakers and of course, uh, all audience for keeping uh, until uh, the end of the session. Again, uh, give applause to all of us. And thank you. Uh, once again, we'd like to invite the uh, all speaker to come forward. We have a little things to give. <laughs> and yeah.